We have several big stories this week. Indiana's Andre Carson on death threats that he received since Donald Trump's call to ban all Muslims from entering the United States. Troy Riggs joins us to talk about returning to government as the new police chief of the city. And our Jason Fector goes to Iowa to talk about the GOP caucus. But we start with the story that dominated the week. Donald Trump's call to ban Muslims from entering the United States after the deadly terrorist attack in California. Indiana Democrat Andre Carson, only one of two Muslims in Congress, says that he has received death threats after that Trump proposal. And he blames Republican presidential candidates for the rhetoric that he says is fanning the flames of bigotry. Uh, Congressman Carson, thank you for joining us from Washington. Sir, you blame Donald Trump and other GOP presidential hopefuls for the death threat that you received. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't blame them specifically. I, I, I think that um, lately we've seen a kind of demagoguery that concerns me, and I, and I think that there have been candidates who are running for office, particularly running for president, who are contributing to a very toxic and hostile environment. Um, I've received threats since 2008, and, and the FBI has, has come in and trained the staff, and uh, thanks to the Marion County Sheriff's Department and Metro Police Department, um, we, we have security very often. Um, I, think, I, I think what most concerns me, though, Mr. Sanchez, is uh, worrying about those people who are fleeing countries where they don't have a democracy. They're running from dictators, and they don't have security. I'm worried about that average, everyday citizen who is being discriminated against because of their religion or color. That's who I'm most concerned about. We all value free speech, so what do you say to Hoosiers who do believe in what Donald Trump is saying, that we should ban Muslims from entering the United States? I think it's unacceptable. I mean, history has, has taught us what happens when we try to mislabel any particular group. We look at the struggles that our Jewish brothers and sisters have had to endure. We look at the struggles that the African American community has had to endure, certainly, and, and is still enduring. We look at the struggles of, of, of Japanese Americans and Irish Americans and so on and so forth. So I, I think it's wrong to uh, uh, label an entire religion or race um, a certain way based on the actions of a few. And there are over a billion Muslims in the world. There are over eight million Muslims in the country. And they're engineers, they're scientists, they're doctors, they're businessmen and women who are hiring Americans and they're putting Americans back to work. And so the contributions that Muslims make to our society since the inception of this country um, can not go unnoticed and so I think that anyone seeking the highest office of the land must understand that this is a pluralistic society. The founding fathers were deeply concerned about this question in the very beginning. One of the very first articles, um, the, uh, they mentioned the Constitution that there shall not be a religious test to hold public office in the Bill of Rights. It really presses this, this notion of not favoring even, uh, one particular belief system and so I think those who claim to be constitutionalist and, and love our Constitution and Bill of Rights should do their research. You know, there is some fear in the country among Hoosiers that there will be another attack from a radical Islamic group. So you sit on the House Intelligence Committee. Are we safe? I think that uh, as, as being a member of Congress, I think I'm the only member of Congress who has worked in an intelligence fusion center. Um, and and I, I can tell you that the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, State Department, um, state and local law enforcement across the country are working tirelessly each and every day to keep Americans safe. I think our largest concern is and will always be lone wolves, those people who go online or read books and become self-radicalized, self-radicalized to an extremist form, form of Christianity. Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, or even those who are non-theists who just have a political agenda that they want to exact through forms of intimidation. So we have to always watch out for lone wolves who become self-radicalized. Now, a remedy to that has been what the administration has proposed, and that is a countering violent extremism initiative, or the CVE as it's commonly known. And that's bringing in federal law enforcement, working with local law enforcement, as well as mental health professionals, and even 
and educators to really take a holistic approach and, and, and working in conjunction with faith leaders, imams, rabbis, ministers, pastors, and so on, and basically telling their congregants, if you see something, say something, and developing deep relationships, uh, Raphael, where it's beyond just being transactional. And I think historically a lot of these communities have been very suspicious because of uh, the, the the disaster that COINTELPRO or J. Edgar Hoover's counterintelligence program was. And so now they're trying to kind of redo the work and approach things quite differently. And I think that there have been a lot of successes. There are a lot of uh, terrorist attempts that are thwarted each and every day that you'll never hear about because these communities, particularly the Muslim community, are working with law enforcement to prevent these attacks. So does Donald Trump owe you and the Muslim community an apology? An apology. I don't, well, he doesn't owe me an apology. Um, I think that he owes the Muslim community apolo uh, an apology. Look, Mr. Trump has done business with, with Muslims. He has Muslims who work for him and who have worked for him in the past. Uh, he simply knows better. I think that he's being provocative. And in this kind of environment, you get rewarded for being provocative. And so we have to be responsible, myself included, about what we say. Congressman Carson, thank you for joining us from Washington. We appreciate your time. An honor. Thank you, sir.